Um, so again, 7 a.m. final exam uh, a week from today. Uh, and be there. Bring your, your monster or your, what do they call those things? Macchiato. Uh, those things, they're like milkshakes or whatever from Starbucks. Anyways, uh, you're welcome to do that as long as you don't spill it. And certainly don't spill it on my computer up here. Otherwise, you'll have instantaneous firing squad. Now, we're going to talk about black holes today. And uh, we're going to start, you know, where we left off with concepts of lensing. But let's just have a question or two. Um, let me pause for questions about the final, et cetera. Question. It's not about the final, but it's, it's nice to get dirt in the last observatory. Oh, observatory. Uh, observatory. The question is, is tonight the last one? Boy, you know, I think it looks like we're, it's, I don't think, is it green? Did they? Do they turn it? It's per still purple. That's the, that's the way they roll, though. You know, they'll turn it green, you know, late in the day. But I don't know. It looks good. I mean, it, last night was clear. So tonight, hopefully, you know, we won't suddenly get, you know, like a mass of clouds. So uh, one more go. One more go around. And, uh, you know, so go tonight if you haven't already been. Now, we're going to have some clicking today that we're going to convert at the end of class into some bonus points. So if you can't ever go to the observatory, you can get four bonus points today from clicking at the end of lecture. And then we're going to have a big mega review inside web courses. That's another four bonus points if you do good on it. And, and so you get a total of eight, same as anybody else that goes to the observatory. But uh, so keep an eye on that uh, and go if you can. By the way, I posted the points um, for uh, the last two, the previous two observatory sessions. Uh, you may have noticed that. I hope you did. Question. Uh, talk to me after class. We'll double check. Okay. Because uh, sometimes I can't. Oh, you know what? You might, have, you might be in somebody, some other instructor's pile or something. We'll talk after class or during the clicking at the end of class. All right, yeah, question. Uh, well, you, no, you, you can, if you come to office hours, you can look at any of the other exams. You could take notes on it, but you may not copy it verbatim. Uh, but uh, the blurb sheets that I've, you know, tried to put out, you know, hopefully I'll get those done by before next Thursday. You can review um, along with your Scantron printout. By the way, have you started giving those out yet for exam three? Oh, no, I didn't do that. Okay, so uh, we can start handing, getting those out to you. Question? Normal office hours on Wednesday, yeah, 9 to 10. Okay, and I guess, Jenny, are you going to have office hours? Probably not. Okay, Jenny says probably not. All right, because she's, she's got exams too. So, But, yeah, I'll be around uh, Wednesday. And then Thursday, 7 a.m. And it's even tougher for me because i got to get all those exams down here and ready for you by 7 a.m. All you got to do is show up. All right, let's keep talking about um, lensing. Uh, we finished up with the lensing of light rays. We're going to review some of the sketches of that. The basic philosophy is this. Um, you know, in the early, before the theory of relativity, we figured that photons were massless particles. They travel at the speed of light. And because they were massless particles, no one would have predicted that they respond uh, to the the two gravitational fields in any way. Uh, but then, um, and so Sir Isaac Newton would never have predicted uh, that a photon from a star behind the sun would do anything else than cruise past Earth and never be seen. But um, what Einstein figured out was that if a photon has energy, anything that has energy or mass it is participating in the curvature of space-time, and therefore it's going to uh, curve slightly. 
And if you're in the right spot, you'll collect some photons from that star that's actually behind the sun. But, you know, it kind of curves around the sun, goes around the horn, and, and, and beams right straight to your telescope. Now, it might be kind of dim, but, yeah, we can, we've measured it for sure. Okay, and, and now, I mean, that was 100 years ago. Back in 1919 was the first big test. Uh, so that's 99 years ago. Uh, they observed uh, def what they call deflection of starlight uh, in a total eclipse of the sun in 1919. Uh, now we see it every, every place. And it, you know, it explains some really interesting features um, around the event horizon of a black hole. So, for instance, the point of no return, that's the colloquial usage that we have for the event horizon. And what we're going to do today is talk about lensing and the formal definition of an event horizon as a trapped surface, a surface uh, of trapped photons. Uh, and, and this is an idea that was um, enunciated about 50 years ago by Roger Penrose, 1965. So now here's a picture that we looked at last time. This is the galactic cluster Abel 370, plus a, a lot of other galaxies. All the yellowish blobs here that you see uh, are, are galaxies almost. And some of the galaxies, actually, if you look at it carefully in YouTube, or if you go to this um, uh, astronomy picture of the day, uh, August 28th, 2016, you'll see that some of the galaxies are a little bluer than, uh, than the others. Uh, so that kind of that arc up here in the, in the upper right uh, of the diagram of the image uh, from Hubble is, uh, is a lensing uh, feature uh, from some of the galaxies way in the back. Now, let's take a look at the sketches. I revamped my sketches for uh, lensing. All right, now, um, let's say that you have a star that's behind the sun. Um, so the, here's the Earth, here's us. Here's the sun, and we're on this line straight from the sun to the earth. So we're not necessarily going to see this star. Anything that cruises past the sun is also going to cruise past us. All right? Uh, according to Sir Isaac Newton. All right? So, oh boy, let me, mm. Let me pause my podcast here just a second. I have to change something. My animation is, I forgot to, come on, baby. Here we go. Okay, so here's the, here's a, the red solid line of a light ray. Um, normally, if the star's behind the sun, it's not going to, you know, we're not going to see it. You know, a photon can get past the sun, but it'll deflect, or it'll, it'll just go straight on down and past the earth it'll you know so we're up here get my cursor over here we're over here where the earth is and this thing goes flying by now somebody out on a spacecraft might see it but here on earth no we won't see it but what so that's what sir isaac newton would have predicted and up until 1919 nobody knew if we, if it would actually do this this is the photon that you actually see so sketching a, a, a dotted line or dashed line, if you like, uh, to re represent. Um, and up here, this photon, it follows the same path initially from the star. It's aimed in the same direction. And Sir Isaac Newton would say, yeah, it's just going to cruise on past the Earth and we're never going to see it. But according to Einstein, no, it's going to curve. It's going to interact with the gravitational curvature which is pretty weak for the sun, but we can measure it. It's tough to measure, but we can measure it. And it's actually going to be visible down here uh, on our planet. So um, that's the one that we can see. It curves around the sun just a little bit. And so as a result, you tilt your telescope out along the incoming path. So here's your incoming path. These dots coming down to the planet Earth, that's where the starlight appears to be coming from, All right? So your star appears to be out here. It's actually behind the sun. And you know from observing the stars over the, over the years, 
You know, if you're an astronomer, you know where that star is, you know, when the sun's not up in the sky. You know, six months previously, yeah, you know exactly where it's going to be. And you know it's, it's not a supposed to be up here. It's budged over by a few degrees or, you know, a few arc seconds, all right, depending on the star. It's not supposed to be there. They know that it's been budged. But the star hasn't budged. Only the starlight has been budged. So you're, you're out here, um, and this is the overhead view. Uh, you know, you're out here looking, you know, so you're looking from the vantage point of the North Star, and, you know, looking. And so, you know, it, the astronomers on Earth, they've got to tilt their telescopes out in this direction. So that's where you actually see that star. Okay, so that's deflection of starlight. Now, I'm going to show you how it would look if you're actually looking through the telescope. All right, so from Earth, um, it would look a little bit like this. Now, here's the sun. Okay, this greenish, yellowish thing over here on the right, the sphere over here on the right. All right, and there's my star. Now, I've parked my star. I've made it clear that it's, you know, here it's in front. Let me put it behind. All right, so there it is, behind the sun. All right. And we're not, according to Sir Isaac Newton, it's a nifty star, but we got to wait for the, the sun to move out from in front of it. All right. But Einstein said, no, you're going to see deflection of starlight. So this is what you're actually going to see. All right, so make a sketch of this. You know, the star is, is back over here. It's behind the sun. That's where its actual location is. But the starlight appears to make it up here out in this direction. So you have to swivel your telescope a little bit to the right in this case, all right, in order to see that star. Because if you, if, you, you know, if, you, if you point it at where you know it is, you're going to be pointing right at the sun and you're not going to see the star. But if you shift it a little bit to the right, and this is really exaggerated, way exaggerated. You know, it's not nearly this big of a deflection, but this is deflection of starlight. So this is where you have to look. All right. So add that. So that's a sketch, if you will, through the telescope of where the star appears to be. All right. And not only stars, but we can see galaxies and, and stuff. Um, here's one of the very first uh, lensing objects, uh, the Einstein cross. Uh, and they, they've been looking at it for um, a few decades. Um, and it is actually the image um, of uh, a quasar, a QSO, a quasi-stellar object. Which is, an, which is a really, really hot, bright galaxy way, way close to the beginning of the uh, universe, very early in the universe. Uh, but it is so bright, the nucleus of the active galactic nucleus is so bright, we can see it as a, an object way farther than any normal galaxy. All right? In fact, everything that you see in this image is actually the uh, quasar. You cannot see the galaxy that's causing the lensing. You can't see that in this image. This is, uh, I think this is an x-ray image. All right. You can't see the, the you know, there's, so there's a, a good hefty galaxy in front of this. We can't see that, but we can see that quasar. And it's been beamed out uh, up and down, left and right. And then the central image there, the, the, the reddish dot here in the center, like right here, yeah, that's, that's also the quasar. You know, that's the undeflected image. That's like going straight through the lens. Uh, so it's, it's interesting. Here's, it, this is a good one to, to write down, too. Go ahead and make a, an X and a Y axis, the yellow sun at the center. And just put a few little arrows now on this one. You know, this is the general lensing idea. So the arrows that are in close, you know, they represent that displacement from where it's supposed to be to where you actually see it. You know, the sideways, um, the, the ones that are in close are going to be bigger. They're going to be stronger because that's where 
curvature is greater. But these, these ones out here, a little bit further out, uh, they're going to be a little bit smaller. But you can still measure it if you, you know, if you have good equipment stuff, good telescope. And so now here's the other thing. If you have behind the sun uh, or behind whatever that yellow object is, it might be a galactic cluster or just a galaxy. Um, if you have something else behind there like this, okay, formally speaking, that is hidden. You cannot see it. Um, but lensing allows you to see it also displaced you know, a few degrees to the right and up in this case. And if it's an extended object, you know, most stars we consider to be a point source, but an extended object like a galaxy is going to get kind of smeared into an arc. So, uh, so deep background objects can be revealed and stuff. And we now use lensing. We have computers to search through astronomical images and look for really, really faint lensing. Uh, and uh, we're using it more and more. To, and because what the lensing tells you, you know, you measure the lensing, and that tells you about something ab about the lens itself, the, whatever it is, a galaxy or a planet or a star, whatever's causing the galaxy, the amount of lensing, you know, the amount of push away from the center um, tells you something about the, the object at the center. So that's some lensing. Well, let's go back to our spherical black hole and talk about uh, lensing effects. And this is actually where we stopped last time. And I asked you to think about a sphere of flash bulbs, and we're going to say that they, they uh, beam off uh, one nanosecond of light. Okay. Um, and so here, here, here goes your nanosecond. And you know, a nanosecond, that's going to be about 12 inches of photon, you know, that, that shell is going to be about 12 inches. And it's going to go out. So go ahead and sketch this. You know, those, you know, I've got three rays, and you can put as many as you want. And the, the photons from that spherical array of light bulbs are just going to go, you know, la, 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 just straight on out. And, and here, here's where they are a little bit later, a little bit further out, still 12 inches thick, all right, and they're still diverging. All right, and um, the more divergence that you get per second, that corresponds to more and more area. Now, if you think of this as a sphere, you know, we've got kind of a cross section of it here, so it looks like a circle. But if you think of it as a sphere in three dimensions, the area of that sphere, a 12 inch thick shell of photon energy, uh, that area is gonna increase you know, more and more per second, all right? So increasing area, write that down, okay? Diverging light rays, they form a sphere. The sphere is gonna be increasing area, okay? Bigger and bigger as it goes out. You know, because it's, it's, if it's flat space time, if there's no curvature effects, they'll just kind of mosey on out three times 10 to the eight meters per second, you know, 12 inches per nanosecond, et cetera, et cetera. And so that, you know, if, if you have a spherical array of flash bulbs, it'll just get bigger and bigger, bigger area, bigger area, bi you know, for every nanosecond, every uh, day, every year, every century, more and more area. It'll be fainter and fainter, but, um, but this, theoretically that surface area is going to increase. Now this is for, make a note, this is part one. This is for flat space time, no curvature. Now we're going to do the same thought experiment um, uh, for a black hole. All right. Now I'm going to represent the black hole space time as um, a sphere uh, that is black, a black hole. Okay. So here's my light bulbs, my flash bulbs, and let's do the same thing. Let's blaze out a nanosecond of light and Let's aim it outward. I mean, you can aim them inward towards the black hole. They'll just go down into the black hole itself. But if you aim them outward, the photons, they try to follow these paths. So, so this is your initial direction for the photons. They're aimed outwards. They're going to try to diverge, you know, right? You know, each one of them. 
you know, no matter which one you look at, and we've got a whole sphere worth. So we're, it's trying to capture more and more area, just like the, the flat space-time uh, set of flash bulbs. All right? So the problem is, in this space-time, instead of diverging, they converge. They lens. And a black hole, they lens so quickly that they do not diverge at all. So they're going outward at the speed of light, but they never get further apart. So the surface that they span, you know, that shell of 12 inches of, of uh, photons, you know, that's a surface. And so they form a surface, and it, listen to me now and make a note of it. The photons have not stopped. Formally speaking, those photons are moving outward at the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. But they are not capturing more area. And that is why we call this a trapped surface. The event horizon is the largest trapped surface. So you can have, you can, you can have a, a set of trapped photons inside the event horizon, but if you're just slightly outside, they'll, they'll converge, they'll still be lensed, but they'll escape eventually. Be, but, you know, so somewhere between, you know, converging and diverging is the trapped surface, okay? And so the, the, the event horizon of a spherical black hole is the outermost surface of trapped photons. Now, light bulb, if, if, you, if you station your light bulbs, your flash bulbs, a little bit further out, no, no problema. You're, and what happens is your photons get redshifted. They're, you know, they're, they're trying to get out, out of a, a curvature. That's what happens. You get a redshift. And uh, if you're going inward, you get a, a blue shift. But going outward, you get a red shift. So, um, so that's that's the def that's the modern and and the coolest definition of the event horizon. It's the place where photons get trapped. Outward moving photons, they're moving out. They're infinitely red shifted, and they acquire no more area. They're trying to diverge like normal photons, but it ain't happening. All right, because of the curvature is so intense. Now, if you have a neutron star and you, you know, you're on the surface of that neutron star, we, we, you know, stuff can escape. I mean, that's how we detect neutron stars. All those photons, you know, X-ray photons, radio frequency photons, we get them, we got them, no problem. It, it's, they're, it's tough. I mean, it's, it's a deep gravitational curvature, but it's not deep enough to trap them. A black hole traps them trapped surface of, of photons. And so that collection of photons span a surface, and that surface is trapped. It's, it's heading outwards, but it's not capturing more area. Now, light bulbs inside the event horizon, those ones, this is another important factor. Even photons that are aimed outward from inside the event horizon. You know, so you're, in the, you're inside the event horizon you know, by a few feet, and you, you take your laser and you aim it outwards. Those photons, it's inevitable that they'll go to the center of, everything inside will eventually go to the center of the black hole, R equals zero. All right, so um, th there's a lot of really strange things. You know, outgoing photons, and they, they get to the center? Yeah. That's what happens in um, a black hole. And the event horizon is where all the really cool stuff starts to happen. So let's take a look at some simple um, algebra here uh, to describe a spherical black hole. So in a, a, a Schwarzschild black hole, a simple spherical black hole, uh, the coordinates you use are just like here on the globe of the Earth latitude, longitude, and because we care about how far we are from the center, we also have 
uh, the radial distance. Okay. Now, on, on the Earth, everything's about the same radial distance. It's about 6,371 kilometers. Uh, so you don't really, you know, use all spherical coordinates. You just use latitude and longitude for the surface of the Earth. But, uh, but, you, but you know who does use uh, radial distance? Uh, NASA on spacecraft, you know, because they're, they're definitely off the surface of the Earth. Anyway, so we definitely want to know how far we are from the center of the black hole. Um, and uh, this, as I've mentioned before, this is the, the Schwarzschild uh, black hole geometry. Uh, using spherical coordinates. And uh, so just write down latitude, longitude, and radial distance for the Schwarzschild black hole. And uh, don't worry about this picture. It's just kind of decoration. So let's talk about the actual radius of the black hole. If you do all the fancy equals mc squared and all the really, really fancy uh, calculus, it's about the toughest there is, you can calculate that the radius of the black hole, capital R, excuse me, the radius of the event horizon is 2 times Newton's constant G times the mass of the black hole. So whether, well, you know, whether it's five solar masses or a million, you know, you put that in in the numerator and then you divide by C squared. All right. Now, um, astronomers and astrophysicists um, are kind of a lazy bunch of you-know-whats. So we use this for the shorthand, r equals 2m. r equals 2m, uh, that's your astronomical or your astrophysical shorthand for, you know, the equation above there, 2 times g times m over c squared. So that's the actual size. So the more mass you have, the bigger the event horizon. And that means that the astrophysical black hole in Cygnus X1, uh, that's got a pretty small event horizon because it's a few solar masses. But the, um, the galactic black hole in the constellation Sagittarius at the center of our galaxy is measured, it's about 4 million times the mass of the sun. So it would have a bigger um, uh, event horizon. So, the, you know, so you'd be quite far away. You might not even notice that, you're, that you've crossed the event horizon for the big one at the center of our galaxy. And, there, and there's other galaxies that have really big uh, event horizons at their, in their galactic black hole. But definitely, if you were to approach, e, you know, even double this range, 4M, uh, for the Cygnus X1 black hole, yeah, you're going to have trouble. Special location around any black hole, any spherical black hole, is what we call the photon orbit. At r equals 2m, uh, photons can stay on a circular orbit. You know, the, the photons that graze past the sun, the sun is no great shakes for curvature. So it just kind of beeps them a little bit. But a black hole is intense enough, the curvature is intense enough that... Um, out at 3m, so another 50% out from the event horizon, photons will actually orbit in a perfect circle, like a planet. And they don't have any mass, but they still orbit. That's called the photon orbit. Uh, and, but it's unstable, so if the photon is just a little degree, you know, so if it's moving just a one degree left or one degree right, it'll either spiral down into the black hole or, you know, veer off to infinity as a redshifted photon. So the photon orbit. Now, the re and this is something that I've mentioned before, r equals zero. This is the essential space-time singularity. Um, the event horizon is a mathematical singularity, but it's not really um, a disaster. I mean, if it's a big enough black hole, you could pass through it without even knowing it. Uh, but you definitely would know no matter how big the black hole, if you're at r equals zero, because you'd be smushed down to zero volume. And as I mentioned last time, it's like a hole punched out of space time with a big hole puncher. You know, you can go from point A to point B, but not via the center of a black hole. Uh, so that's, that's a little bit um, problematic. And that's where our laws of physics break down completely. We just don't you know, at r equals zero, we don't have any 
we don't have any Newton's laws of motion. We don't have any Kepler's laws of orbits. You know, we just don't know what's happening there. And then R going to infinity, so bigger and bigger. So if, if your R is like 17,000 M, it's pretty flat out there. So the bigger your radius, the closer to infi you know, infinity, you know, the, the flatter it gets. Right? And you know, there, there's some black holes near us, I'm sure. I don't know what the nearest one. I should actually look that up. Uh, it might be Cygnus X1, but whatever the, the black hole is that's near us, we're so far away, you might as well just mark it down as infinity because space-time here is pretty flat. The sun is just a little pimple of curvature, and the Earth is not even that. It's like a little, you know, I don't even know what that is. The Earth is, but, you know, Earth's got curvature, and we can measure it. Now, let's talk about light cones and how they beh behave near r equals 2m, all right? Now, here's an important diagram. I want you to diagram it really carefully, all right? On the left is a black hole. Now, I've represented the event horizon at 2m as a, a semicircle, so we're cutting off half the black hole so we can fit it all on the screen, okay? So r equals 0 is on the far left, and then I have the r axis going out to the right, so R going to infinity is out to the right somewhere. And notice that I've got a squiggle here to symbolize, you know, that's, you know we're making a little break, and, but it, and it keeps going, and eventually out there somewhere is R equals 17,000. But I've got it sketched out here, and I did it carefully. Here's 2M, here's 3M. Okay, so that's an, so try to get that proportion right. All right, so, so here, Mark down 2M and then draw your circle or half circle and then kind of eyeball half of that and go to the right and that's where 3M is. Okay, now if you don't get it perfect, it's all right because it'll be on the podcast. It'll be on the YouTube, all right? And then the other thing that I did, I just, you know, kind of picked a generic, this is a nice big distance out here, uh, 12M, you, you know, you can put 20M or whatever you want. But I could fit in this scale, for this size black hole, 12M is right about in the middle of the screen, okay? And infinity M is way off to the right, okay? So, so now remember, we're trying to figure out what light cones do. And what I want to do, before we get to the light cones, I want to talk about what lasers do. Because lasers, you know, they, they travel on those 45 degree uh, light cones to the left or to the right, ingoing in this case, outgoing. All right, so we're, gonna, we're first going to talk about lasers. All right, and I'm going to put another mark here, 10M. Okay, go ahead, kind of eyeball in 10M. And let's say that you, you, you're in a spacecraft at 10M. Now you're safe as can be, you know, you're outside the event horizon. So if you have enough rocket fuel, you can escape and get back to Earth. Now, Earth is way out here to the right. So there's the squiggle symbolizing um, a cut in the distance scale. And here's Earth out here. Now, you have a blue laser manufactured at the Blue Laser uh, Manufacturing Company on planet Earth. You take it with you. You jump out of your spacecraft and you dive straight into the black hole. Actually, you go feet first so you can signal back to the spaceship with your blue laser and back to Earth with your blue laser, okay? So you're going feet first into the black hole. So you kind of, you know, like jumping, just like jumping off a diving board and just going straight down feet first, all right? Now, so you get to 10M, uh, you jump out and you send out a blue flash, all right? Now for, you, and make a note of this, for you, if you, you, know, you shine it on your hand, it'll look blue, all right? But by the time it gets to Earth, that blue flash of laser light has red shifted into the greens, perhaps, all right? So, the, and this is, this is where relativity, this is the heart of relativity. You disagree about time and space measurements, and you disagree about colors of photons. So it's a blue photon, when you, but it's observed as a green photon, a red-shifted photon. 
Okay, because you're coming out of, it, it, your, your photon is, is beating its way out of that curvature, and to do that, it changes color to the observers uh, that are at infinity, like Earth, all right? So let's say that you um, blaze out another flash of the laser at R equals 5.5, just for, you know, conversation purposes, all right? And by the time it gets to Earth, this flash, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be red by the time it gets back to the space shift at 10 M. And it's going to be even redder. It's, you know, it's, it's a blue laser, but you're observing it as a red light wave. All right? So outgoing photons are going to, they're still going to move at the speed of light. You know, just like the trapped photons, they're still... They're still going at the speed of light. These ones are going at the speed of light. But what changes in the curvature to the outgoing photons is the color of the photon. You know, somebody at infinity in flat space time is going to see uh, your signal getting redder and redder. All right. So just write etc. at the bottom there. Now, a lot of times you see this set of statements oh, time goes more slowly. Uh, for the astronaut, um, that, no. Time still is, the astronaut, you know, you're, you jumped out of there feet first and you've got a Timex, right, on your wrist, and it's still going 60 seconds a minute. It looks perfectly fine until you get smooshed down at the singularity at R equals zero, then, you know, no, who knows what happens then. But what you can say, this is correct, that the observers disagree about time measurements. All right, now that's, that's related to this red shifting that's going on. So, and here's, here's the way that you would want to describe, um, and, and this is contra to a lot of the popular descriptions of time near black holes versus Earth. Your clock on Earth ticks to infinity before you see the astronaut's last tick. Now, he's going to eventually cross the event horizon, you know, like 30 seconds, seven, 37 seconds after he jumps out of the, out of the spaceship. You know, so he's going to take 37 seconds, you know, tick, 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 you know, on his time mix, and then he's going to know when he's across the event horizon. All right, so he knows 37 seconds or whatever it happens to be, you know, depending on how far he is when he jumps out. Now, his 37th tick will never be observed on Earth. Right before the event horizon, that 37th tick, you know, they might see the 36th, but it'll have to be billions of years in the future. The clocks on Earth will go to infinity before they see his last tick. I mean, if they're observing his, his wristwatch you know, or an, an identical wristwatch turned towards the Earth if they observe that. The curvature of the outgoing photons is redshifted. So from Earth, as I mentioned, uh, the, the wristwatch and the laser get redder and redder. Then they're going to get infrared. The closer to the event horizon, the more redshift. And eventually, it'll be an infinite redshift. So that you'll, you'll go past infrared. It'll be shifted even deeper into radio frequency. And eventually, an infinite redshift means the, the wavelength goes to infinity. It close. Now, that's for, for you on Earth. All right. Now, for him, he's, he's got blue photons. Everything's hunky-dory. And if it's a big black hole, he won't notice for a while. He'll be, be, oh, nice, blue photons, sweet. You know, and he's aiming them out. But when he events, but, he, you know, he might not realize it if he doesn't get squished down and turned into spaghetti uh, if the black hole's big enough, all right? So like the center of our galaxy. But Cygnus X1, yeah, he's going to be turned into spaghetti before most of this stuff happens. But uh, anyway, so theoretically, this is it, all right? And, uh, and by the way, these are, these are good numbers. I, I worked all these out for um, a galactic black hole. So uh, now, let's look at what light cones do, all right? Uh, maybe make another copy of this diagram, because now you got to type in your your black your light cones, All right? The light cones out in are going towards infinity. 
lovely 45 left and right. All right? Perfect, nerfect. Closer in, starts to tighten up. Now your, your light cone is starting to, it's squeezing itself down. Or the, what causes the red shift also for light cones causes the light cones to get squeezed down. All right? Now here's the wild part. Right? The light cone gets tighter and tighter until you get down to the event horizon and then when you cross the event horizon, the light cone broadens out and flips over sideways, my friend. Now, I can't show you the, the geometry and calculus of that. It's extremely difficult. But I can show you the picture of what the light cone does. This is kosher. The light cone tips over. Here it is. Oh, my goodness. It's tipped over so that it's looking... I mean, here's the time axis, right? It goes right up the spine of the light cone, whatever, whatever the light cone's doing, the spine of it is the time axis, so there it is, all right? And guess where that is pointing? The center of the black hole, which is right there. So what that means, my wonderful students, is that R equals zero is in the future of everything that has crossed the event horizon. And that's what it means. That's another way of, of describing, in terms of causality, uh, what happens inside a black hole. So let's take a look at that. What does it mean? That the R equals zero singularity is the omni future. That's what we would call it, the omni future, the future of everything. Everything, photons, crayons, mosquitoes, sharknados, everything. The future of everything is R equals zero. It once you get inside the black hole. All right, so now a regular calendar. You know, let's go ahead and make a little sketch of calendar. You know, it's a grid. You know, you got numbers on it for each day. One minute every 60 seconds, one day every 24 hours. And, you know, you go through the calendar. And so you never go, this, you know, you never go backwards. You always go forwards. And a specific time like next Tuesday is inevitable. I mean, Tuesday's coming. You know, 60 seconds a minute. That's the speed. Okay, it's coming. You know, we're all, and we're heading toward it. It's inevitable. We're not, we can't head away from it. But spatially speaking, you know, like in this classroom, the spatial coordinates, you know, x-axis, y-axis, z-axis, um, we can walk to and fro on that. You know, we can move out of the lecture hall. We can walk across the, three, the spatial dimensions, but time, we're always moving forward. Now, inside a black hole, Inside the event horizon, the inevitable point is not next Tuesday. It's a spatial position, R equals zero. Now you might say, all right, Dr. B, everything gets swallowed up by the singularity, nice. But here's the interesting part. The time axis becomes walkable. Flat space time, we walk X, Y, Z, no problem, no problema. Instead of a black hole, the time coordinate becomes a walkable coordinate. So the calendar of days, when you cross the event horizon, has become a chessboard. In which you can move back and forth to your heart's content. Now, we're never going to find out what that's like because we can't get any information out of a black hole. But this summer, when you're out looking at the skies and you're doing a little stargazing, now you know. You know, here's, here's an example. This is July 19th, three months in the future, 9.53 p.m. This is what it'll look like. If you're looking to the south and the southeast, Guess what you see? 
Sagittarius. Sagittarius the teapot. All right. It looked a little bit like that. All right. And you'll see a teapot. And in that constellation is the center of our galaxy. A little bit to the left, here's Sagittarius down here, and then up here, Cygnus. Right now, we can't quite see it yet, but this summer, in a few months, we'll be able to see it. And it's a little bit in the northeast, east-northeast, to see Cygnus. Right now, here's what Cygnus looks like. All right. It looks like a beautiful swan. And right about here is Cygnus X1. And here's how you, you can remember these two black hole locations. Cygnus X1 is a swan, you can see it here in this figure, that is flying down the Milky Way towards Sagittarius. So find the Northern Cross, the Cygnus, the swan, and then follow his path down to the teapot. And when you do that, you'll be looking at uh, the location of two black holes. Inside the event horizon, we have this unusual behavior of time in which the future and the past are like left and right. They're walkable. But the center of the black hole is inevitable. So when you're out there stargazing and you're thinking about your future, you're out there with somebody nice and you're looking at this beautiful stars. Just think about that. Cygnus X1 and Sagittarius and the future and what it means. So whatever your future is, make it a good one. Thank you. All right, now what we're going to do the last 15 minutes here, my wonderful students, if I can get the cursor back, come on, baby. There we go. All 